everyone loves an outlaw, a fugitive from justice, hiding out, fighting for what he believes. This is Sherwood Forest in the Midlands of England, home to one of legend's favorite fugitives, Robin Hood. But everyone knows these wild tales are made up over hundreds of years using fanciful characters and whimsical locations. But Robin Hood's legend has the benefit of some very compelling evidence, such as this gnarled oak tree. More than a thousand years old, known as the Major Oak, situated on the edge of Sherwood Forest. It's reputedly the secret location in the forest where Robin Hood and his merry men hung out. Maybe this pub, Ye old Trip to Jerusalem, is the reason why they were so merry. It's the oldest inn in England, and the renegades spent many hours here plotting their next assault with the dastardly sheriff of Nottingham always on their trail. And this is his castle. After 700 years, now all that remains of it are these old gatehouses pinpointed by chronicles as the location for some of Robin's most extravagant and daring stunts. Nearby is this church, the place where Robin Hood and the fair maid Marion were married by Richard the Lionheart. But every legend can boast real places. What of the real characters? This worn stone is the grave of Will Scarlet, one of Robin's faithful band of merry men. When he died, he wasn't allowed to be buried inside the graveyard because he was an outlaw. He had to be buried out here. Here in Hathersage, a few miles away, lies this long grave, historically recorded as being that of Little John, Robin Hood's best friend and lieutenant. In the 1700s, the grave was opened, revealing a thigh bone measuring 32 inches. This could only have belonged to a man over seven feet tall. The stories tell of Robin being struck down by a terrible and crippling illness and being taken to this local priory for whatever help they could offer. Nearby is the grave of the evil prioress who welcomed Robin in that day, Elizabeth de Stainton. She was in the service of the Sheriff of Nottingham and had been bribed to dispatch the outlaw by any means. So when the ailing Robin was helped up these stairs and into this room by little John, instead of nursing him back to health, she bled him to death. As he lay here dying, he asked little John to pass him his bow. I'll shoot an arrow where it falls, there shall I be buried. Tragically, Robin Hood, the expert archer, could no longer muster enough energy even to lift his bow. So with his last breath, he told little John to take the shot for him. The shaft landed here, an arrow's flight from the priory where he died, in the soft earth of the forest where he'd lived for so long. Most legends offer very little proof of their authenticity. This is one legend, however, that has certainly left its mark. This is the grave of Robin Hood. His epitaph, dated 1247, reads, here underneath this stone lays Robert, Earl of Huntingdon. Never archer was he as good. All people called him Robin Hood. Such outlaws as he and his men, England will never see again. Would you believe it? The stories of Robert Louis Stevenson have gripped the imaginations of readers for generations. His life of travel and adventure around the world led him to the Pacific island of Samoa. In such an exotic setting, it is easy to imagine the source of his inspiration for one of his most famous stories, Treasure Island. But here in Edinburgh, the inspiration for his other classic, Jekyll and Hyde, was far more bizarre. This wardrobe owned by the Stevenson family was made by an Edinburgh cabinet maker named William Brodie. And it was Brody's incredible life of high society and crime that inspired Stevenson to write this, the double life of Deacon Brody. He returned again to that theme in his unforgettable classic, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. William Brody was a respected member of Edinburgh society. He was a deacon of the incorporation of masons and cabinet makers and a valued member of the community. By night, however, 
a different side of Brody emerged. Sneaking out of his townhouse undetected, he would roam the streets. In strict contrast to his public life, he would frequent the roughest areas, the most debauched drinking houses, the darkest corners of Edinburgh's criminal underworld. Edinburgh was a city of rampant crime, a city where a character like Brody could easily lose himself. As day broke, he would return to his home and his life as Deacon Brody. Nobody ever knew his double identity, and he continued to mingle with the cream of Edinburgh society. By day, he would frequent all the best houses, and then by night, he would return with a hand-picked team of low-life scoundrels. For more than 10 years, Brody committed a series of violent and mysterious crimes that had the authorities baffled and the whole city terrified. He was finally caught here, just off Edinburgh's Royal Mile, when his drunken accomplices bungled a raid on the county excise office. Brody's trial was a sensation and was followed daily by the citizens of Edinburgh. When he was finally hanged here in this square, more than 40,000 people turned out for the event. With his life counted in minutes, Brody's arrogance was still clear. It is said that he tried to cheat death by putting a silver tube inside his throat to prevent his throat from being crushed by the noose. And as soon as he was cut down from the gallows, his twitching corpse was rushed to his home where a doctor attempted to revive him. Years later, speculation was rife about whether Brody had succeeded in escaping to the South Seas. So his grave was exhumed. Inside was an empty coffin. Perhaps Brody did manage to escape to his very own treasure island. But wherever he rests, one thing is certain. Thanks to Robert Louis Stevenson, he lives on in the characters he inspired in the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde.